Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, EBM Tools Network for short. Um, and as an update, probably a lot of you got this email, but where the EBM Tools Network is now coordinated by both NatureServe and Open Channels. Uh, and I'm pleased to have Nick Weiner from Open Channels here um, as co host. Um, so we're also very pleased to have our presenters here. We have Daniel Dunn from Duke University, Sarah Maxwell from Old Dominion University, and Alistair Hobde from CSIRO, who is here, who is uh, up at a, the very, in the very early hours of the morning uh, over in Australia. So we very much appreciate all of them being here. Um, and before we get started, I'm going to turn over to Daniel in just a second, but I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. There's two ways to ask questions. You can click the uh, hand icon on your user in your user interface and that will raise your virtual hand. Then I can unmute you and you can ask the question directly to our presenters. We'll, uh, if you have a question you want to ask directly to our presenters, we'll do that during the question and answer session at the end. Um, or you can type your question in into the question panel um, of the user interface and I'll relay that question to the, to the speakers. Um, just quick clarifying questions, I can ask them during the presentation. Um, and more substantive questions will hold to the end. But again, you can send in questions at any point using uh, the question panel, but uh, verbal questions that you ask out loud uh, will hold to the end. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much again, Daniel, Sarah, and Halster, and I'll turn it over to you now, Daniel. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Specifically, I, I do want to thank you and Nick and Open Channels and uh, MEME and the EBM Tools Network um, for the opportunity. I think I got everybody in there. Uh, for the opportunity to do this uh, presentation as well as the opportunity to contribute to the to the newsletter and the, the website. We're really excited about trying to get this information out um, and this is a great forum to do it, maybe the best one I know of. Um, also wanted to uh, uh, thank my uh, co-presenters and particularly Alistair for, for getting up so, so early in the morning. Um, uh, before we begin, I just want to note that this is work that uh, that we have been doing through a variety of funding mechanisms for um, a while now, uh, it, just, it just sort of rolls on and on, um, but we need to particularly acknowledge on my part the, the NERIUS program who's funded by the Nippon Foundation and uh, on uh, Sarah's part the Center for Ocean Solutions and her new organization Old Dominion University and, and Alistair uh, CSIRO in Australia. Um, we're going to take this, uh, as you might imagine, because there are three presenters, we're going to take the uh, presentation on in, in three parts. Uh, Sarah will provide the sort of overview and uh, definition of dynamic ocean management because it is a, a new uh, concept and, and we are trying to, to broaden the audience for it. And then uh, Alistair will provide a number of examples and I will um, uh, come in at the end to uh, provide a sort of comparison among different types of dynamic management measures um, and then uh, maybe a little ecological theory at the end just to keep everybody awake. Okay. Uh, again, and thank you all for, for taking the time out to participate in this. We really appreciate it. I'm going to hand over to Sarah now. Okay, I switched it over to Sarah. Okay, great. I guess I did. Is that in full screen for everyone now? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, everyone, for joining us on this webinar. Um, as Daniel mentioned, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of dynamic management, um, just kind of help you to get your mind into focus and, and get an idea of what it is we're talking about if this is something that's unfamiliar to you. Um, so starting off, um, current management as we know it um, generally treats the oceans and our impacts on them um, as stationary. While we recognize that the, the ocean and the users and the animals within them are somewhat dynamic, most of our management measures, such as marine protected areas and marine spatial planning, are largely static, um, even though what's going on within them is highly mobile. But it's clear when we watch a video like this that the ocean really is a fluid and dynamic system. Um, the methods that managers have, been, have applied to managing um, such things as marine vertebrates, fisheries, that kind of thing, such as marine protected areas, have been largely stationary. Um, but stationary management is likely to be less effective, particularly when we're talking about highly or even semi-mobile species um, and when dealing with mobile human users such as fishermen. So 
So for example, how could we draw a box around ocean features or animals such as um, these lay sand albatrosses that are moving over scales like this? Now try uh, to imagine drawing a box to protect even a small portion of the movements of northern elephant seals, which you can see in green. Um, it would be such a large portion of the ocean that obviously that would be somewhat politically unfeasible. Um, we can protect parts of their range using stationary marine protected areas or more um, stationary management measures, but more flexible management approaches really can help us to incorporate more of their movements as they flow through what is really a dynamic ocean. So applying a dynamic view to spatial management of the oceans is what we've been referring to as dynamic ocean management. Um, through a Center for Ocean Solutions working group, um, we define dynamic ocean management to mean management that changes in space and time in response to the shifting nature of the ocean and its users based on the integration of new biological, oceanographic, social, and or economic data in near real time, so on the order of days to weeks. So why is dynamic management particularly useful? Um, the first, which we've already touched on, is that the ocean itself is dynamic. Um, there are a number of dynamic species, habitats, and activities that occur within the ocean. Um, second, um, dynamic, uh, dynamic management can really be used to reduce conflicts um, across different kinds of pressures. So for example, dynamic management can be used to meet multiple objectives such as managing target quota, bycatch reduction, and reducing some of the interactions that we have with a lot of um, particular species of conservation concern. Um, and this is something that um, Daniel's going to touch on quite a bit more, um, but that we, had, uh, we were able to quantify in a recent um, paper. Um, as a result of this, it really allows us to refine management areas, ideally for a, a more uh, palatable political cell across multiple groups because we're able to incorporate multiple objectives and reduce the size of managed areas. Dynamic management um, also has a lot of potential to really help us, um, particularly in the face of climate variability and climate change. So as our baselines really shift, as climate change progresses, this gives us a flexible tool in order to change boundaries instead of being um, stuck within the static boundaries that have been put into place perhaps 20 or 30 years ago in some cases. And then finally, you might be thinking, Dynamic management sounds a lot like adaptive management. How is this actually different? Um, and the way that we see dynamic management is not that it's meant to replace adaptive management. Rather, it really is complementary to adaptive management. And it really fits in at that implementation phase. Um, so while adaptive management and all of its um, various components continue, it's at the implementation phase where we have this new information and we're able to move boundaries and change um, our management measures in short periods of time very quickly that dynamic management really fits in. So for example, just uh, to give you kind of a theoretical place to put your brain, and Alistair is going to talk about this um, in a lot more detail, um, one issue that I've been working on more recently with a number of collaborators at NOAA and San Diego State um, and Stanford um, is the drift gillnet fishery um, in California, which largely targets swordfish in the U.S. off of California. And there's a really large seasonal closure that's put into place to, protect, um, to reduce bycatch of leatherback sea turtles, um, despite the fact that leatherback encounters are rather rare. However, leatherbacks are highly endangered. Since the uh, closure was put into place, leatherback interactions have reduced to almost zero. Um, however, this has been at a huge economic cost to fishermen. And if you look at the image on the right side of the screen, you can see that leatherbacks, this is satellite tracking data, they're really not likely to be everywhere within that large static box. Um, they're queuing in on different environmental features as they follow prey. And we can use different data sets, such as tracking data, to understand the features that turtles and other bycatch species, in this instance, are using. And theoretically, we could predict into the future where they're likely to be and turn that large static box into a closure that moves in time just like highly mobile species do. This would give the fishermen back some of their fishing grounds and simultaneously balance ecological and economic objectives. 
So we now have the tools to do this kind of work. Um, as a result of advances in satellite tracking, uh, remote sensing, and analytical techniques, um, and this allows us to create the sort of mathematical models we need to understand why animals go where they do, and then also to predict that kind of movement into the future. I mean, it's important to note that dynamic management really doesn't need to be as complicated as what I just described. Um, and Alistair is going to give a number of examples, and um, Daniel is going to cover this um, graph in quite a bit more detail. But the idea is that as we go to more dynamic um, management measures, what we get is a higher resolution, uh, increased complexity of management, but what we can really see, oops, sorry, um, is that it becomes a lot more, a lot more um, efficient and then we actually are able to reduce the time and area that's put into closures. And with that, I think it's time to turn it over to Alistair. Okay, I'll switch it over to Alistair. Okay, great. Um, good morning, everybody. The, the series of um, lessons I'll share with you are from those three papers that are on one of the title slides that is available later in the presentation. Um, there are seven elements that you really need to have in place in order to do dynamic ocean management. Um, the first four of them are really technical, and that's about getting the data, uploading it, processing it, and then delivering it back to an end user. Um, there are three other additional elements that are really important, though, and if you ne neglect those, your dynamic management approach may not, may not work. And those last three elements are decision-making, how it's implemented, voluntary or compulsory, and the enforcement. Um, of, of that dynamic management solution in a particular application. We've classified four types of um, dynamic ocean management tools and they differ in their complexity as Sarah suggested. Type 1 application is really just gathering information from a variety of inputs of a variety of users and perhaps statistically averaging it and then sending it back out. The second yeah, type is a little we're getting a lot of, uh, it, it's garbled, and I think it's probably, it, it might just be the interconnect connection, but uh, can you try moving where your microphone is relative? Um, we'll see if that helps. Yeah, no, the microphone's as close to it as, as, it, as I can get it, Sarah, if that's the okay. case. It's good right now. So Okay, so let's, let's roll right now. It's good right now. Okay. Uh, I'm just describing that we have four types of of dynamic ocean management, ranging from very simple, which we call type 1 and just requires a simple reprocessing of data, all the way through to type 4, which requires multiple data inputs, a lot of statistical analysis, perhaps use of a dynamic model, and then adjustments by a range of stakeholders to the product that you produce. And I'm going to go through examples of each of those now. The first example is for a scallop fishery on the east coast of the US. And this is a type 1 um, dynamic ocean management application. The situation in this particular area is that bycatch of yellowtail flounder is not desirable and there's a very strict quota limit in the scallop fishery. And if they catch the flounder before they fill their, their scallop fishery catch, the fishery is closed. Um, in recent years, from 2006 to 2009, the yellowtail quota was caught before the scallop was caught. And so the fishers were forgoing up to $20 million in each year as a result of catching too much of the bycatch species. The solution that was implemented was to get fishers to report every day what the ratio was of scallop to yellowtail. There were commercial sensitivities about reporting absolute catch numbers. So instead, they just report all the ratio. That was said to Kate O'Keefe and her colleagues on land, and they just averaged the, over the fleet where the distribution of this bycatch ratio was high and where it was low. And then the next day, that would be sent out as in this schematic here, which just shows a series of columns that are um, referenced in the law and system which that fleet uses. 
and that would tell them whether green it was probably safe to catch because the bycatch of yellow yellowtail um, flounder was low, and red cells where the bycatch was high. And if you avoid those red cells, there was more chance that you would all um, catch sufficient scallop not to close the fishery. Hey, Alistair, let's um, try. Do you have the headset on? I do. Uh, we'll try the microphone actually farther away, and then I'll let you know if it, that's better. It's 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 coming in and out. Like sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. Um, and if not, maybe we can try without the headset, and just see if that improves it. Okay. I'm sorry for that frustration. And actually, we could make the call just actually to ask um, Daniel or Sarah to take over. They know this material also, so you make that decision too. Um. Try, try taking off the headset. We'll try it, and if not, yeah, I'll, I'll, Dan or Sarah, you might be on. You might be up. Okay, I have the headset off now. How is that? Uh, better. All right. All right. Okay. Um, just just finishing up the description of the yellowtail bycatch. In the first year of its operation, as soon as it was um, available to be used by the fishers, the actual bycatch ratios changed radically and the fishery was um, fulfilled in that very first year. So you can suggest that that's about a $20,000 project that delivered $20 million of value in the first year of use. An example of a type 2 analysis that results in a dynamic management solution is a move on rules example. Now this one's theoretical, um, but it's, it's a really nice example of how to do this in a structured um, statistical fashion. These rules are used in Antarctic fisheries and in an Australian pelagic trawl fishery. And in principle, if you experience catch of a particular species, then you're required to move to another location and wait a certain period of time before you begin um, fishing again. Um, then you'll have a little piece of work which shows how you actually define these rules quantitatively. And in particular, these might be useful when your goal is to reduce um, interactions with a suite of species. And so it's the ability for this, this approach to be multi-species that's really interesting. The data that is required to do it is the high resolution location and distances and times between all the activities. And then you're looking at the serial correlation between those activities in time and space. So again, this is an example that was designed to be used in the Georges Bank fixed gear section. The results have been provided to fishers, but as yet this has not been implemented. And the statistical technique that's used in this type 2 application is called the replace case statistic. And I won't go into that anymore just in the interest of time with this um, technical delays that we're having with my presentation. Um, but the results kind of look like this figure here, which has two panels. Um, the one on the left shows the distance that you would have to move um, in time and for a particular species, and in this case it's a distance of seven kilometers or about one day in order to avoid a particular interaction. On the right hand panel it shows that the, the optimum solution is to move around two kilometers or wait two days. Alistair, I think it's I think it's getting to the point we should probably switch off. Uh, Daniel or Sarah, are you able to Uh, yeah, this is this is my work. I I can walk through the rest of the these slides at least if if that's helpful. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I'm so probably sorry, only... Alistair. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, there are only I think one or two more slides on this, and then sadly, actually, we get into Alistair's work in in Australia. Um, so we might want to check back in with him then or not. Uh, the basic gist of this is that these move on rules are. Um, uh, super high resolution and um, very dynamic compared to what is currently being in, used uh, in fisheries to try to decrease um, bycatch or uh, uh, decrease discards. Um, oh, that just uh, we just lost the uh, slides. Are you okay? Um, and what you see now is just basically some yeah, of the yeah. Uh, I think he's yeah. Yeah, that's back up. Uh, some of the results from the um, initial, uh, from this theoretical example, uh, in particular, I don't know, um, we can probably, yeah, I'm not sure if anything gets highlighted here, but in particular you want to highlight the fact that um, you you get some very large uh, decreases in, uh, in hagfish, hagfish depredation rates, uh, 50 some odd percent uh, reduction in those, as well as um, 
30, 32 or 33% reductions in, in juveniles, so you can use this across a number of different types of bycatch. So we can probably move to the next slide. I don't think I, yeah, there we go. Um, uh, the uh, example of the type three um, uh, type of dynamic management uh, is really the most common example that we we've used frequently is Turtle Watch, which is a program uh, from the Pacific Island Fishery Science Center um, in, to, that they supply to uh, the swordfish uh, pelagic longline uh, fishery out there uh, to avoid loggerhead sea turtles. Um, sadly, I don't actually know what the next slides are, so. I'm just going to keep talking, and Alistair, you can move forward with them uh, uh, as you see fit. Um, this fishery, uh, they supply a daily product to the fishermen. It's completely voluntary, uh, but what they did was basically by identifying um, a, uh, creating a habitat model based on tags of, on augerhead turtles, they identified a, a temperature range that the turtles stayed in uh, as they were migrating across the North Pacific, uh, and I think that's 17 and a half to 18 and a half degrees. Uh, so every day they provide a map of this sort of 17 and a half to 18 and a half degree uh, region um, to encourage the fishermen to stay out of the, uh, that particular area and decrease bycatch. Uh, the reason that this probably uh, is useful to them is that there is a bycatch quota for uh, loggerheads in that fishery and the fishery has been closed in the past entirely uh, due to it reaching that um, bycatch limit. Uh, they, they've just actually um, put out a paper last year expanding it from loggerheads and, and doing another model for leatherbacks. This is work by Evan Howell and uh, Jeff Palladina. Uh, so we get to the Australian examples. Alistair, do you want to you wanna try your mic again? Um, no, that sounded like it was really frustrating for people. And um, will you give this your best shot? Okay, uh, this is going to be fun. Um, all right, so Alistair's done some amazing work in Australia, really some of the, the initial and seminal work that um, probably inspired a lot of us to begin contemplating this. Uh, in particular, um, he works with CSIRO uh, to um, the particular example that we're going to look at now is the East Australian longline uh, fishery in an effort to decrease bycatch in southern bluefin tuna in that fishery um, they, again, through putting out a lot of uh, um, uh, archival tags on uh, the tuna, were able to come up with a temperature range, um, uh, a, a model, a habitat model for those tuna and the temperature ranges that they preferred. And what they, they then did was to design um, a sort of um, look at the area and divide it up into three different um, parts, the core area uh, where um, the southern bluefin tuna that was the made majority of their habitat in which you could only fish if you had a large quota, uh, a buffer area which you could fish if you had a small amount of quota, and then an, another area on the north side which uh, you can fish if you have no quota at all. You, you must fish in that area. And as you can see, it's been operational since 2003, uh, which predates most of our uh, thinking about dynamic management. So again, a really seminal piece of the puzzle here. Um, so they supplied that information as you see here, the, the, um, it's based on uh, sea surface temperature, uh, and that temperature fluctuates throughout the, the, um, the year, even uh, daily, monthly. So they supply, I believe it's biweekly uh, maps to the managers who then take those maps um, and apply, uh, make decisions about more specific um, boundaries for each of those zones. Right, so this is, you can see here, this is the final product on the right uh, that the management hands out to the fishermen. The area in the red on the bottom is where you have to have um, enough quota to participate in, to fish in that region. The little light green area is the, the buffer zone where if you have a small amount of quota, you're allowed to fish. And then the northern region uh, is the region where you have to fish if you have no quota. Right, so I get the general idea here is that if you just uh, if you just try to do this latitudinally, um, you're you're not going to have a very good fit to the actual habitat model, and you may end up with quite a bit of of uh, bycatch. Um, whereas if you actually try to use uh, increase the management complexity a little bit um, by mimicking uh, the 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 model, 
uh, you can have a better a better fit. Uh, so I suppose this is this looks like uh, multiple different different levels of complexity um, that the management uh, were contemplating. Uh, you can see on the left that these are just in straight lines, straight latitudinal lines. Um, the middle one involves a little more complexity with uh, how the buffer area is defined, uh, and the last one uh, involves significantly more complexity with how each one is defined. And, and uh, Alistair has papers uh, indicating the benefits of, of creating uh, slightly more complex uh, versions of the, the final rules. Um, and the fishermen are very uh, capable of, of following um, not just those lines, but far more uh, complex information than that. Uh, and clearly the management has, has caught on to this and has, has begun to use uh, more complex versions of the model output as time has progressed. Mm, this, <laughs> uh, I'm not quite what this is. We can understand you to some degree, so you can go ahead and uh, we'll let you know how it comes in and out. Um, this one's just a new one. At the, at the point that we published this, uh, this idea that management was using more and more complex output was in the data was up to 2008, and we thought everything was ticking along fine. But then we noticed over the next few years, complexity was actually dropping off in the management, and we'd stopped engaging as heavily because the system was um, automated. And so, as in about, it took us two two years to work out there was a problem. In 2011, we started engaging very heavily with managers again and explaining to them how to use the system. And at that time, management complexity jumped up. Well, we relaxed again, and the managers changed again the next year, and performance plummeted. So we engaged again. And so it just shows that if you don't continue to engage, you won't get the best solution with dynamic management. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So in, in summary from these examples, um, they differ in complexity. They are operating around the world. Where they have been used, they've been effective in reducing bycatch. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them have come into play when there has been a crisis in the ocean such as a fishery closure or a number of whale strikes or, or a problem that means that a big stick will come out if you don't think of a good solution. Um, they're technically possible because the first four elements of implementing a dy management, dynamic management system have been in place, but then some legal and management barriers remain. Um, in particular, most systems remain voluntary and all of the ones that we know of are happening inside countries EEZ, so we haven't seen any high seas examples of dynamic management for fisheries yet. And I'd make the final point that engagement with your stakeholders is really critical, as I showed with that last slide. Um, back to you, please, Daniel. Yeah, sorry, I think you can trade. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, thank okay. you, guys. Uh, all right, make presenter, Daniel. All right. Okay, it's a pleasure to actually be presenting my own slides as opposed to uh, somebody else's slides and actually having an idea what is going to come on the next slide. Um, hopefully that is represented in how I present it. So my part on this, uh, this series of presentations is really to focus on um, comparisons between types of static and dynamic management. Uh, and this is largely, if not entirely, based on uh, a paper that I uh, put out with Sarah um, Maxwell as long as as well as uh, Andre Bustani and Pat Halpin here in the Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab um, earlier this year. Uh, right, and so not just that, but also why why it works is we'll try to tackle that at the end. Um, so as Sarah showed in, in quickly this slide before, what we're trying to detail here is the the sort of different um, resolutions that you you get uh, the. Um, with dynamic management, that there is not just one type, but as Alistair sort of went through, there are a number of different types, and there are also different types of static closures. Uh, so in this case, we have seasonal fixed area closures, time area closures, event triggered closures, which are those move on rules, and uh, oceanographic closure, closures, which are the, the sort of sea surface temperature rules that, uh, or um, closures that Alistair showed before. Um, and as we go down this, they become uh, higher resolution, but they also increase in the, the management complexity. Uh, but as you go up it, as, as Sarah indicated, you're really increasing the time area used, and we have assumed that that means you're also um, uh, decreasing the efficiency of your uh, outcome. 
and basically you're using more area than you have to to achieve that outcome. But that's really always just been an assumption on our part uh, as to how dynamic management should work and the benefits it should give you. Um, and in particular, uh, there are two types of, of dynamic uh, management that, that we want to look at. One is the sort of dynamically instantiated, that is those um, measures that are triggered by an event, like the move-on rules, and then the, the, the oceanographic um, closures. Um, so we tried to, we did a, a management strategy evaluation using the uh, Northeast uh, um, multi-species fishery, uh, the cod fishery off of New England. Um, and uh, what we wanted to do was look across these different types of closures and, it, and we were able to look at seasonal closures, fixed area closures, um, uh, time area closures, uh, and event trigger closures, but unfortunately we're not able to consider oceanographic closures uh, due to the fact that the, um, what we really needed was bottom temperature and the models for bottom temperature didn't have a high enough resolution uh, to be useful for this type of management, um, high resolution management. So I expect that in the next couple of years we will see that, but uh, we weren't able to include that in this management strategy evaluation. The, the general scenario that we were working, on, working with was the idea that we wanted to decrease uh, juvenile um, catch of cod. Uh, so we're trying to maximize the catch of, a, of cod and, de and um, minimize the, uh, the amount of juveniles that are uh, caught. And the, it's a pretty simple algorithm that we, that we looked at. Basically, we're contemplating the percent uh, of the bycatch reduction. Uh, there was a target in place for that. We were basically trying to achieve a 60% reduction. Um, and that was just to try to match something across all of the, uh, the types of measures. Um, we did look at other uh, uh, targets as well just to confirm that the results were um, reasonable. Uh, and multiply that by the bycatch reduction um, uh, over the catch foregone, so essentially your efficiency of, uh, of, of how you're achieving that um, uh, bycatch reduction, how much catch are you losing, and then uh, dividing that by the, the total time area required by each of these measures. And what we came up with is a, um, a series of results where we have the individual results, the, um, the in percent bycatch reduction here you have is the target, and again, we're trying to achieve at least 60% uh, reduction. Um, the amount of the target catch, the percent of the target catch affected here in the third column, hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, and the bycatch reduction efficiency, uh, essentially you want greater efficiency, it means you're less catch affected. Um, the number of closures, the area of closures, and this area of closures is important because the area of the individual closure is really the resolution um, of, the, of the management measure. And so you can see here the difference between the resolution of a monthly closure, total closure, and a, a single move-on rule is m many orders of magnitude. Uh, and you can get the idea then that if, even if you have 48 move-on rules implemented or, or activated, it uh, still doesn't really actually come close to the, uh, an, a single monthly total fishery closure. Um, and what we found for the results is it was actually somewhat surprising in how clearly uh, the trends were shown across the different types of measures, and that is that as the, the resolution um, decreased, uh, more more target catch was affected. Each time you, you increase the resolution of the, the management measure, that is the, each time you make it uh, a bigger and bigger closure, um, you affect more catch than, um, than the lower resolution ones. That's kind of obvious, but even across when you have many, many uh, small closures, it doesn't equal the amount of target catch affected as the big closures do. Um, similarly, the, the opposite side of that, that uh, uh, that results in less efficient bycatch reduction. Um, the, the amount of catch affected compared to the target cat or, or the bycatch reduction is um, decreases as you uh, decrease the resolution. And then um, the spatial temporal uh, efficiency, basically you, you put the, the amount of space time used compared to the total amount of space time available uh, um, also uh, increases as uh, the size of the closures increase. Um, and again, this isn't, this isn't due to the size of the individual closures, it's, it's the number of closures and the size of the closures that are required to achieve that bycatch reduction. Um, and so in the end, it, we have a, a log um, metric that we used 
to try to see how they compare to each other. And you can see this is basically showing you orders of magnitude difference in the efficiency metric that we used uh, between the coarsest measures and the, um, the most dynamic measures, the move-on rules and the, the daily grid-based closures. Um, and this just gives you an idea of, of what those trends look like, maybe a, a, a better idea visually of what those trends look like. You have the bycatch reduction efficiency, so going from left to right across the x-axis here, uh, we have the essentially the resolution of the closure. Um, uh, and bycatch reduction efficiency decreases as you, you know, as uh, the closure resolution gets coarser. Um, the, the, the overall uh, spatial temporal utility metric, the amount of space time used, uh, um, uh, gets, gets worse. Uh, not just the amount of space time used, the overall efficiency metric uh, decreases as resolution of the uh, closure increases and the percent target catch um, affected increases. Okay, so those results may seem confusing, particularly as I'm trying to uh, read them out to you, um, but they're really underpinned by uh, some, some really basic ideas in ecology. And I, although this, um, I don't, I'm not sure open channels is always the forum for uh, ecological theory, uh, uh, we're going to try to jump into a little bit of ecological theory here. And um, what I want to get into is just this idea of, of trying to understand why this works, not just show you empirically that it does work, but, but why would we expect this to work and why does it work? Um, and the fundamental uh, uh, example that I have here, the analogy I have here is, is uh, Wiley Coyote and the, and the Roadrunner. And the, the reason for that um, is the Wiley Coyote is always trying to match his speed to Roadrunner, right? You, you know, he's got to be just the right speed to be able to catch Roadrunner. If he's going, you know, if he tries a little, uh, not quite enough, then he doesn't quite reach Roadrunner when he's jumping for him. Um, or alternatively, if he tries too hard, he goes flying past Roadrunner and off the cliff and, you know, he ends up getting killed for the 13,000th time or something like that. And the point here is that if the management measure is too small compared to the process that it's trying to address, uh, then you don't actually achieve the results you want. Um, that you don't get results. Uh, whereas on the opposite side, if the management measure is too coarse, which tends to be the case, we don't actually have a lot of really fine management measures. If the management measure is too coarse, then you get coyote running off the, the cliff. You basically, you've gone too far and there are consequences uh, for fishermen or whoever the, the, the folks on the ground are um, to the fact that you're using more area and time than you need to use. Um, so uh, what sort of evidence of this uh, do we have? Um, in the same fishery, in the northeast multi-species uh, fishery, groundfish fishery, um, this is the density of spatial temporal measures that are used in that fishery. And really the point that I want to get across here is that, um, and I think this is the case for most developed uh, fisheries, developed country fisheries, is that there are there is literally one example of a, of a closure that is smaller than 100 square kilometers. Uh, everything else is larger than 100 square, square kilometers, and most of them are much larger than 100 square kilometers. So, you know, from an ecological perspective, we can think about this and say, okay, well, what sort of processes are we addressing uh, when we uh, use closures that are 100 to 100,000 uh, square uh, kilometers in size? Um, and we have some, some theory to go back on to contemplate this, um, and this is a uh, a reference down there at the bottom, um, Hori et al., 1978, that I highly encourage anybody who's interested in this to go back and look at, um, because not only does it reproduce the Stommel diagram that we all know and use, but it also has this table, uh, which starts to talk about the types of the dominant patterns that you see at different scales in the ecosystem. Um, and in particular, if we look at the, t the scales that fisheries uh, management acts on, uh, you get uh, you know, the sort of coarse to macro scales, and um, hopefully you can see here the dominant patterns. They have victorial, reproductive, uh, coactive, and social. Um, and the thing is that most of the fishing, uh, fisheries management happens at this 100 square kilometers to thousands of square kilometers, and really the dominant patterns there that you can affect um, are vectorial and reproductive, or that you interact with are vectorial and reproductive. And vectorial are the sort of environmental um, uh, factors, uh, so um, connections to um, uh, physical oceanography, uh, that sea surface temperature front um, connection. Um, 
whereas uh, if you get into finer scales, you get to these coactive and social patterns. Uh, so the immediate question there are, well, okay, so what are coactive and social patterns? That, what are these coactive and social patterns that we're missing at the, and by only managing at the larger scales? And this is where we get into even more ecological theory and uh, hopefully everybody's favorite person, G. Evelyn Hutchinson, um, who in, described this in 1953, so this is obviously not new information, that uh, coactive patterns are patterns that arise from interaction between species. Um, and you can tell when we talk about these, competition, niche partitioning, predation, parasitism, these are the types of things that really govern something like bycatch. Uh, and it's also the social patterns which are determined by signaling of different kinds uh, leading to spacing or, or aggregation. So um, Sarah Maxwell likes to use an example of seabirds uh, knowing where to forage, facilitated foraging by um, looking for uh, tuna or species in the water that are, are, are foraging. Um, so you get these types of, of patterns and if we put those into a, a space-time diagram, a Stommel diagram, um, you can see that they go across this, this sort of large range and they, they overlap a bit. And this is, this is really our opinion of this. Uh, hopefully somebody will, will take us to task and, and put their own version out there. But this is sort of how we saw it in, the, in this, this paper we put out this year. Um, and you can overlay fisheries management on top of that. And the monthly and annual time area closures um, really, as we, as we know, act in 100 to 1,000 kilometers. And they're really only interacting with those reproductive patterns. They can't they can't uh, efficiently um, address coactive and social patterns. But if we also plot the dynamic measures that we're talking about onto this, um, we begin to see that they can uh, interact with the, the drivers of bycatch, these coactive and social patterns. Oceanographic closures sort of go across all of these, which makes sense because they're addressing vectorial patterns. Um, but the, uh, the grid-based closures uh, start to get down into the, uh, the days or hours uh, time scale. And the move-on rules really get way down into uh, actually where the so social and coactive patterns are, are occurring. And so it really uh, my, my main point here is just that what we know about dominant patterns at different scales um, makes sense, really underpins this idea of why dynamic management is useful. It's not just, it's not just a correlation that we're finding out there. There, there are um, processes that drive pattern at different scales, and if you want to address those processes uh, most efficiently, you have to do it at those scales. So that's, that's my uh, ecological theory um, seminar for the day. So uh, the take home messages here really are that uh, dynamic management seeks to align uh, the temporal spatial scales of, of management with the, the resource, resource users and, and markets. Um, we're, we're, we're not just looking at uh, um, a population model and trying to figure out you know, how the population is doing from one year to the next year. We're looking at how that resource, uh, what drives the, the distribution of the resource in time and space uh, and, and use of that resource in time and space and trying to align management measures with those scales. Um, as, we, as Sarah said, dynamic management is, is not meant to replace static management or uh, adaptive management. Um, but where possible to make them more efficient. It really slots very nicely, as Sarah showed, into uh, adaptive management and is probably going to be critical for our ability to rapidly address uh, uh, shifting resources under a changing climate. So I think we have yet to actually see the, probably the most useful um, applications of dynamic management. Uh, as Alistair showed, there are a number of existing examples of dynamic management. This is not pie in the sky kind of stuff. Uh, the move on rules in particular are implemented in a lot of fisheries. They may not be empirically based, but the actual um, application is a dynamic application. Uh, technically, uh, this has all been made possible, as was said multiple times, by advances in data collection and data upload and data processing, and, and these technologies really do exist and, and are not terribly expensive to put in the hands of, of fishermen, um, both on a voluntary basis or a regulatory basis. Uh, and finally, there, there is some uh, question about the legal and management um, barriers that remain and, and some work that needs to be done uh, on, on our part um, to engage with managers and fishermen um, and other industries to sort of show the utility to everybody of this uh, new type of management. That's it. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you guys. I'm so sorry about the technical problems, um, but but uh, still, nonetheless, it was, it was a great presentation. We're very to learn more about this. Um, we do have, we have had some questions come in, so I'll go ahead and start with those questions. But just as a reminder, um, folks can ask more questions by typing them into the question panel of the user interface or raising your virtual hand and I'll unmute you. Um, and Alistair, we, we can sort of understand you. Um, it comes in and out, so um, if, if the question, if you're the appropriate person to answer a question, uh, feel free. Um, Okay, so starting off, this question came in when Sarah was presenting, and it, it was, how do you convey the message of shifting closures to fishermen? How is this information received by the fishermen? That's a great question. Um, and there's really a variety of ways um, that go from very high tech to very low tech. Um, so probably the most low tech um, version is one that Alistair talked about, and maybe this was lost in the um, uh, technical difficulties, but in the um, the scallop fishery um, off New England, um, what they do is basically it's just through email. So what happens is, and this is a voluntary example, but what happens is the fishermen um, email um, the researchers every day, say this is what I caught in each of the grid cells in terms of um, uh, yellowtail flounder bycatch. They sum that together, and then they just send out a list. It's literally text in an email that's done every day. So very, very simple. Um, I believe there's an example in Peru where um, the information is communicated by just simply by radio, um, which all of the fishermen have and use regularly. Um, some more complex examples. Um, uh, there's a number of dynamic management type things that are in place for the right whale fishery in New England. Um, so, for example, they have a series of uh, buoys, like passive, passive acoustic buoys that they use to um, detect right whales when they're in the area of the um, Cape Cod shipping lane. Um, some other things where they do aerial surveys. There's a whole suite of measures that they use to detect right whales. Um, but their main, one of their main ways of reaching, in that case, um, uh, captains of ship of the shipping fleet, um, which are you know the issue because of um, ship strikes um, on right whales. Um, they ha actually have an app and it's called Whale Alert. Anyone can download it. I have it on my phone. It's kind of cool. Um, and basically what it does is it, um, it outlines, um, for example, there are dynamic closures that they put into place. It tells um, anyone who has the app, it tells them not just where they are, but it also alerts them if they enter into one of those areas. Um, so it actually has an alert feature on there. Um, and also, for example, with the drift gill net fishery, we're still very much in process with that um, project, but we're working on creating a website and then um, further on down the line an app that will not only allow for fishermen and managers to be able to see a lot of the information, but then also to be able to interact with it. So, for example, to see um, habitat features and be able to turn things on and off if anyone is familiar with Sea Sketch or Marine Map. Um, we're working with UCSB. I think I saw that Will was on the call, Will McClintock. Um, we're actually working with them in order to develop um, something to, to be able to be that interface. So a lot of different examples. Okay, and Sarah and Daniel, if you can look at the chat interface, Alistair is telling us all sorts of things. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, to add, he, he was just... Um, Oh, commenting that uh, in Australia um, we send by VMS message and internet because um, many fishers now have internet access on smartphones. Um, and that he said for legal reasons and compulsory systems you need to prove the fisher got the message and you can verify reception via VMS. Interesting. Yeah, and I think that it, in some ways it depends a lot on where the fishery is in terms of how far offshore. Um, so for example, there might be some fishermen might have satellite uh, based internet on their on their uh, boats, but not a, not all of them do, and so um, in that case something like radio and that would be, uh, would work out even better. But if they're close to shore, then it becomes increasingly easy with other various mechanisms that we all use in our day-to-day -day lives, so. Okay, okay, great, thank you guys, and now we have a ton of questions. Oh, let's see. Um, Next, uh, currently these enforcements are strictly voluntary. Uh, do you know currently the percentage of participation from stakeholders? Um, 
so first, they, they're actually, there are regulatory versions of this. Uh, most of the move on rules are regulatory, uh, and Alistair's example, um, of those, those zones, uh, the zoning of the southern bluefin tuna um, quota is regulatory, regulated. So it's not, the, they are not all voluntary. Um, okay, and the, and, and the question may have come in during the description of one that sure. was. Sorry. Sure. And the second part of the question? Uh, it was, do you, for ones that are voluntary, do you know um, the percentage of participation from stakeholders? Mm. So uh, let's see. Alan yeah, Sturgeon, you said scallop okay. voluntary went from 20 to 80 percent. Yeah. Very high. I think the Hawaiian longline one is not as high. I think there have been outreach issues there. Yeah, um, that's my understanding as well. And I'm assuming because uh, Alistair's is regulated, they're 100% compliant. Um, and any idea about the flounder fisheries in the Northeast? There was a specific question about that. Um, the flounder fishery, it's not specifically a flounder fishery. Maybe you're talking about the, the multi-species ground fish fishery. Uh, and in that case, we didn't actually give any examples where they are rules implemented in the fishery. The example that was offered was a a theoretical um, result. Uh, there are examples of other fisheries, um, ground fish fisheries, which uh, do have those move on rules, um, but they are mostly regulated. So compliance, in theory, uh, should be quite high. Um, the best examples of those probably come from, the, from Scotland. Uh, they have something called Scotland Conservation Credits, um, where, and that is really geared towards reducing um, uh, juvenile cod bycatch and reducing cod uh, effort. That person may have also been referring to the scallop fishery where they're trying to right. avoid bycatch of yellowtail flounder. So that right. might be a little bit of confusion there. Two species, would, one target, one bycatch. So. Right, which would be the 20 to 80 percent, moved up from 20 to 80 percent. Yeah. OK, all right, thank you guys. Um, let's see. Most of the examples involve fisheries management. This makes sense because both the species involved and the human activity are mobile in space and time. Uh, do you have any ideas on how some of these ideas might apply to other types of human activity in the sea, such as energy production, where the activity is less obviously mobile in space and time? I, I can answer that, but only um, from anecdotal evidence, which is that I have seen a couple presentations where um, turbines, underwater turbines, uh, wave turbines, um, tidal turbines, I guess, uh, have, are shut down uh, when marine mammals are in the vicinity uh, based on somebody apparently watching the screen. Um, so I think as long as, uh, I think we do have examples um, also in fisheries of, of it being dynamic management not being solely useful for uh, um, highly mobile uh, uh, pelagic species, but also for, for commercial species. Um, and I, I expect the same is true for other types of industries. Okay. And Alistair said naval exercises involve dynamic closures. They restrict access to other users, but they're not environmentally driven. And I could imagine, too, for example, with wind energy, a lot of times, so uh, birds and, you know, in interaction with turbines for a number of different reasons are uh, um, a concern and, and radar, for example, is one thing that's been used rather heavily packed you know, species in the vicinity. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, that could be something that could be could occur in rather rapid time um, to detect. You know, when they're there. Same thing. You could use oceanographic features to determine. You know, for example, timing of movements or areas where, um, say, wind turbines are put in a heavily um, potentially heavily used uh, foraging location. You could use, um, you know, modeling to predict when they're likely to be there or not, and turn them on and off from that kind of a thing, that kind of a perspective. Uh, let's see, Alistair said, for a terrestrial, great ter terrestrial example, the TNC in California pays farmers to flood wetlands when birds are migrating. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. All right. Um, there are a couple of rights-based management questions. Let's tackle those. Uh, could dynamic management uh, be increasingly used through rights-based, access-based management schemes such as ITQs? Uh, that's individual transferable quotas. 
I would say um, it's a little bit different, but again, the Nature Conservancy um, in California works with the ground fish fishery um, in California where they actually pool their quotas together um, and then they, you know, of a number of different rockfish species in particular. Um, and I could imagine an interface there that could be really useful. Um, they actually have an, an app that they use or a website um, called um, eCatch. Um, and that they, they basically they share information about what they've caught and where they've caught it. And so in some ways it kind of hints at a dynamic approach, although it's not officially, but I could see the two of those things interacting incredibly well and being incredibly efficient um, in terms of, you know, both staying under quota and reducing bycatch. Uh, and Alistair said, yes, you can allow differential access to areas based on performance. If you have low bycatch, then you can continue to access areas and the poor performers uh, could be excluded. Yeah, um, an example of that is, I believe, the Pollock fishery in uh, off Alaska and, and salmon bycatch. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still the case, but at some point in time in the past, they've had, had, they've had zones that um, you could use if you uh, maintain low bycatch. Okay, awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, let's see. We have a, a number of more. Um, does dynamic management require real-time species tracking? What if a species in question does not have such a capability? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah, we. I mean, some of the examples we gave are are, are pretty specific to um, all of the move-on rules. They have no are not based on any kind of tracking information. Um, so they're really they're just uh, they're either negotiated and then um, changed adaptively, or you could do it empirically, um, as we tried to show. Uh, so it, it is definitely not not required. It's for certain types for developing the habitat models, you would need something of the sort. Maybe Alistair and Sarah can talk further about that. Yeah, and another example is the yellowtail flounder, um, uh, the bycatch of yellowtail flounder in the scallop fishery. There's been, as far as I know, no tracking data at all done there. Um, and they, you know, that's been a very successful example. Um, and I, you know, I kind of started with that, and Daniel sometimes gets mad at me because I focus on the, the mobile species because it's kind of my bag. So um, <laughs> I end up kind of uh, sort of maybe biasing some of the thinking that way. But no, it absolutely does not require um, tracking. It really just requires potentially just the, you know, the interface between users and the ability to um, put together information and then distribute it quickly. And that information can range from anything from satellite tracking to survey data to observer data to just catch data from the fishermen themselves, as a number of the examples have shown. So it's, um, it's really not at all a requirement. And it does not have to be high tech, which is probably one of the benefits. OK. Okay, great. Let's see. We have three really good questions. Any, 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 any. Um, back to the rights-based yeah. fisheries. Um, have you guys had the chance to apply or consider this type of management in TERFs, that's territorial use rights for fisheries, I believe? Not the spatially, spatially limit, the limitation of a TERF, but with small-scale fisheries. TERFs in regions with heavy coastal populations not very far, well, say, and multiple stakeholders. Or is it more species gear specific? Is that clear? There's a. Yeah. Daniel, do you want to feel that? I'm not very up on sure. turfs. So, um, so there, I don't know of any examples specific to turfs, but um, we are trying to gather uh, more information on small scale fishery use of dynamic management. And this goes back to what Sarah just said, which is that. Essentially, at its core, what we're, all that's necessary is rapid communication between fishermen, or not even rapid communication, but um, rules based on a particular type of event occurring. And so we do have some examples of um, dynamic management being used in small-scale fisheries. Uh, the other thing that I think um, is, is critical to understand is that it's, not, it's definitely not gear or species specific. Uh, it's, it's more incentive specific. Um, if the incentive is in place to um, reduce a certain type of event, whether it's bycatch or um, juvenile, not catching juveniles of a species, uh, whatever, whatever the, the incentive is, if that's in place and if TERFs help put that in place, 
um, then the dynamic management can just be used as sort of information sharing as opposed to um, a regulated version of it. So there's, it doesn't, it, you don't need a specific type of, of um, management or governance scheme uh, for dynamic management to use, I think, uh, to, to work. I think we can find examples from, from probably all types of governance. Yeah, I okay. think that's a great great answer, and I would add that kind of that dynamic, or sorry, adaptive and that dynamic management interface, you could very easily replace the adaptive management with something else and basically just have dynamic management be the implementation portion of it. Okay, great. Thank you guys so much. There were, there were some more good questions we weren't able to get to, and I'll send you those when I send you the webinar report um, so you, you can see what they were. Um, and thank you so much, all of you, especially Alistair, for rolling with the, the <laughs> technical problems and, uh, and, and, and carrying on with the show. And uh, Alistair, I'm, I'm glad you were still able to contribute for us, uh, via the chat. So anyway, thank you guys. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Alistair. And um, thank you, everyone who was able to participate. And uh, we hope to see you again on future webinars. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Great afternoon. Thanks, okay. Or morning, <laughs> everyone. Okay. Bye.